from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Library of Congress celebration of Constitution Day. I am Roberta Schaefer, and every day I have the joy of serving as the 22nd Law Librarian of Congress at this incredible institution and working with James Madison as my muse. Before we get started, just a few words about logistics. In the unlikely event of a water or other emergency, Library staff in the room will direct you to the best exit or to safety areas. Please wait for their instructions and don't panic. Now, please make sure any articles you brought with you are securely placed in the seat in front of you. All electronic devices are in their proper mode and your minds are in an open and unlocked position. Two important events relating to the U.S. Constitution take place annually in this relatively short time span. The first is why we are gathered here this afternoon, and that's to celebrate and commemorate the signing of the United States Constitution. Each year, we pay tribute to the signing of the Constitution by 39 legal entrepreneurs who on September 17, 1887, following a record-breaking hot summer in Philadelphia, came forth with this incredible document. Constitution Day came into its own, having originally been somewhat connected to Citizenship Day, and in 1952, a joint resolution created Constitution Day, and part of it urged us to use it as an opportunity to learn more about our responsibilities as citizens. An annual reminder about civic education, as we would probably call it today. Years later, Senator Robert Byrd put special responsibilities on federal civil servants. We are supposed to carry our pocket constitutions with us at all times. Here's mine. And oh yes, the other event, in a little more than two weeks, the United States Supreme Court will begin its new term. We here at the library could not think of a more appropriate speaker to bring these two events together than Dahlia Lithwick. Ms. Lithwick has been covering the United States Supreme Court for 12 years with insight, exuberance, wisdom, and wit. A senior editor at Slate Magazine, she is the go-to law expert for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and National Public Radio. According to Legal Affairs Magazine, Dahlia is one of the 20 most influential legal minds in the country, an accolade she shares with few others, including Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, Professor Alan Dershowitz, and fellow or is it sister-in-law journalist Nina Totenberg? Dale Lithwick received a BA in English from Yale University and her law degree from Stanford. She clerked for Judge Proctor Hugg on the United States Courts of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, worked at a divorce law firm in Reno, Nevada, covered the Microsoft antitrust trial, and brought these and other experiences to her Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence Prudence columns for Slate Magazine and others. Dahlia is gifted with the ability to use mirth and plain language to help us understand much of the law and the court's most esoteric subjects and provides right on insights into the reasons and reasoning of individual jurists and justices. As evidence, allow me to read a few chapter headings from her 2003 book, me versus everybody, absurd contracts for an absurd world. 
In the chapter Domestic Mayhem, Mayhem, she has something called an agreement for peaceful sharing of single bathrooms among multiple users. And under the chapter Office Hazards, an occupational health and safety regulation is produced there for the workplace refrigerator, which I often refer to. While my staff prefers the Vendetti construction sample contract on immediate relocation of your boss. However, since we are at the Library of Congress, which collects leading works in all disciplines, I would be remiss if I neglected to mention that Ms. Lickwith is an award-winning children's author. Her book, I Will Sing Life, written with Larry Berger and seven campers from Paul Newman's Hole in the Wall Gang Camp, for children with life-threatening diseases was given the 1993 Joan Fassler Memorial Award. It is with the greatest pleasure and honor that I present Dahlia Lithwick. Thank you so much, Roberta. That was incredibly kind, and thank you uh, uh, Law Library of Congress and Library of Congress for inviting me here to celebrate uh, Constitution Day with you all and with Mr. Madison. Uh, I've never stood at the feet of a framer while talking about the Constitution before, so let's see how this goes. Um, so happy Constitution Day. I guess it's Constitution Weekend, technically. If you're going to read your Constitution, do it tomorrow. Um, read every word. Um, and my topic today, I thought I would talk a little bit about something that's been obsessing me in the past year, uh, something that seems really uh, inside baseball and wonky, but is actually incredibly compelling and interesting, and I'm going to try to persuade you of that, and then I'm going to try to leave lots of time for questions. But what I want to talk about is the relationship between the media free speech, the First Amendment, and the U.S. Supreme Court. And I don't want to just talk about it in terms of doctrine. I want to talk about it in terms of the court itself and how I believe that the media and the First Amendment and the relationship between those things in the court and the court's notions of privacy are starting to affect not just the way the court thinks about the world, but First Amendment doctrine. And I think it's something we need to think really hard about. Um, going forward. So I want to just start by pointing out that there's a really interesting split at the Supreme Court right now, and it's not the split you expect. It's not the standard 5-4 conservative-liberal split. It's a split that is best embodied in my mind by a little smackdown that happened uh, at oral argument in the violent video games case last term. That was the case where California tried to ban violent video games uh, for minors was challenged on First Amendment grounds, and the most unlikely duo got into it at oral argument. Uh, so S Samuel Alito is pressing counsel at argument on uh, violent video games and whether they're free speech, and Scalia is defending them, Justice Antonin Scalia, is clearly free speech, and you may recall a wonderful moment where Samuel Alito leans over into his microphone and says to counsel, Counsel, Justice Scalia really is asking, what did James Madison think of violent video games? And it was this amazing moment where you have these two originalists at the court having an originalist fight about 21st century technology, but more profoundly, a fight about what is speech and how do we think about speech. And I think that there's a split, a fascinating split, between Justice Scalia on the one hand and Justice Thomas, Alito, and I'm going to submit Breyer on the other about how we think about speech and new technology in the media. So I want to start by saying that the Supreme Court, and this is a fairly self-evident point, has an incredibly complicated relationship with the press and with the public. It's a relationship that isn't just about how they think about speech, it's a relationship that comes right down to how they conduct themselves from day to day. So on the one hand, you have a court that wants to hold itself out as 
uh, uh, completely uh, above the law. The only thing you need to know about us at the court, you know from the four corners of the opinions we write. Anything else that we say is confusing, so we're just going to say what's in the four corners of our opinions. But they also want to be involved in the national conversation about the law. And so even though they purport to be above the hustle and bustle about what the law is, just in the last few years, we've seen Supreme Court justices appear on Larry King Live, PBS NewsHour, Charlie Rose, NPR, ABC, C-SPAN, uh, interviews in The New Yorker, The Washington Post, Bloomberg, among others, USA Today, and an unforgettable appearance by Justice Stephen Beyer on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. So the justices on the one hand want to say, we don't engage with the public in this way. On the other hand, they're very much engaging uh, in this way. And I've often joked that the reason the court's docket has shrunk significantly every year for the last 10 years is because they're spending all that extra time in the makeup chair. Now on the one hand, you have a Supreme Court that completely relies on the press to get the word out. It has always been like this. It is like this by design. They are completely slaves to the scribes who translate what they do to the world. But on the other hand, they are incredibly protective, like no other branch of government protective about how that message gets out. So think about it. We have three branches of government, and only one doesn't allow cameras in. Only one doesn't give press conferences. Only one makes it virtually impossible for me as a reporter even to go and do my job. I can't bring a tape recorder in, uh, certainly no cameras. Uh, I can bring a pen and a paper, and that's it. Uh, there are millions of Americans who would love to know what the court is doing day to day. And the court has systematically restricted the press corps to a handful of people who really are relied on completely to get the word out. Not only can we not take in tape players, we can't even take in newspapers. One of my favorite moments at the Supreme Court early in my career was when I tried to bring in a copy, I was a little early, and I tried to bring in a copy of Kafka's The Trial, just to read in the half hour that I was there. And you really haven't lived until you've tried to explain irony to a marshal who's confiscating your book. I was like, but it's Kafka. Yes, ma'am, leave it here. Um, so finally, I think on the one hand, we have a court that says that it doesn't care what the press says about it. Again, it's above the law. And we know that they obsessively follow the press, that they care deeply what the media thinks of them. There's a name for this, right? It's the, the greenhouse effect. Uh, and it's not entirely coincidental that the Supreme Court cares very, very deeply about what the world thinks, because the only way that they can communicate with the world is through the press. But at the same time, they have to pretend they don't. And trust me, that's a tricky proposition. That goes all the way back to John Marshall, who used to brag, quote, I scarcely glance at the papers, uh, to Justice Clarence Thomas, who says, uh, the happiest day in my life was when I can canceled my subscription to the Washington Post. And so I think, again, we have this very ambivalent relationship with the public and the press, completely reliant on them, and yet completely attempting to control the message. And with that as a sort of framework, I want to posit to you that an important change has happened in the last few years. It's a technological change, and it's a change in the media, and it's changing this relationship in ways that I think are quite dangerous. I want to also point out, and again, this seems self-evident, but it's worth saying, that there's a reason that there are stone turtles built into the Supreme Court building. The Supreme Court is proud to say that they move slowly, except the stone turtles don't move at all. Uh, but the, the Supreme Court really does say when asked, why, why won't you allow cameras in there? The answer is we move slowly. We accept technology very, very slowly. We have to think about these things. The big, dramatic technological change at the US Supreme Court this year, are you ready for it? The frozen yogurt machine that Elena Kagan uh, brought into the cafeteria. So really, I think the court is, is very, very, very unlikely to embrace uh, new technologies anytime soon. So this brings us to, um, I think, a, a stretch of cases that I want to talk about, and I'll try to talk about them quickly in the last two years, that reflect, I think, a really 
growing anxiety and ambivalence about uh, media and technology in the court and privacy. And I want to start with a court you may a case you may remember from a year and a half ago called the United States versus Stevens. This was the famous crush videos case where there were these quite disgusting uh, animal violence videos that were being made and Congress attempted to ban them. And the challenge comes up to the court, is this protected free speech or can we in fact ba ban these videos? And by an eight to one margin, the court says, of course, this is speech, of course, this is protected free speech. We're not gonna create a new category of banned speech uh, just for animal cruelty. The dissenter, interestingly, in that case, and I think surprisingly to some of us, is Samuel Alito, who really does, I think, a very deft job of saying, this is different, this is coarsening, this is cruel. These videos are, they have no merit, and they are simply speak to a lack of civility and a lack of humanity. And this is, I think, a, a sort of benchmark for where he's going to start to go in the following two years. The next case I want to talk about briefly is uh, a case that, that only comes uh, out as an opinion. It's not argued at the court, and that's Hollingsworth versus Perry. Now, you mem may remember this case. This is the Prop 8 trial in California. That's the gay marriage referendum. And the district judge, the lower court judge, determines there's a Ninth Circuit policy that allows the thing to be filmed on camera. And he says, you know what, I'm going to film this, because it's really important. This is a landmark case. And uh, I'm going to film it. I'm not, it's not going out into the world on C-SPAN. It's not going to be uh, next to Real Housewives. But it's going to be on YouTube and in a couple of courthouses around the Ninth Circuit. The appeal goes up to the US Supreme Court. Can this trial be filmed? And the issues really are questions of, of harassment of certain witnesses. And the court, in a 5-4 per curiam opinion, this is a year and a half ago, says, nope, we're pulling the plug. We're not going to let this trial be filmed. And they overturn the district court, and they say it, language that, that maps really beautifully onto what we're going to hear later in the Citizens United decision, that they're most worried not about the free speech rights of the public who want to see the trial, not the right of access. They're worried about these witnesses. They're so strongly identified with the expert witnesses who may be subject to reprisal and harassment for testifying in the trial that for that reason alone, they're going to shut down this trial. And there's a really amazing quote in the per curiam. So per curiam means unsigned opinion. It's a 5-4 opinion. And there's a, a, a quote that I want to read to you because I think it says that this shift is coming. Quote, there are qualitative differences between making public appearances regarding an issue and having one's testimony broadcast throughout the country. So expert witnesses who have been on YouTube, who've been on television shows, there's something different in the Supreme Court's view about being broadcast around the country in a trial. That's interesting. That's not something we've seen before. And the, the evidence that the court uses, and this is important, is that those Prop 8 supporters in California, you remember they had their lawn signs knocked down, their mailboxes knocked down, some of them were subject to boycotts and financial reprisals. That's the evidence the court uses here, that there's this very, very strong sentiment that people who get up and testify against gay marriage are going to be subject to harassment. And that's enough for the court to say that overrides the public's right to know. Again, this is new. Now, all of, this, all of this analysis drops wholesale into the third case. Again, we're talking about not last term, but the term before. And that's a case called Doe versus Reed. This is a really interesting case, another privacy um, and reprisals case. This is a Washington state ballot initiative that is going to do away with Washington's all but gay marriage act. So they're trying to get um, a referendum to end Washington State's uh, uh, same-sex marriage act. And they, it requires signatures. They need 120,000 signatures from Washington State residents to get onto the ballot. Now, it turns out that Washington State's Public Records Act, its Sunshine Law, says all those signatures, if you sign a ballot initiative at Walmart, that goes up online on the internet. It's not in some clerk's office the way it used to be. If you want to find out whether your neighbor signed uh, this ballot initiative, you can just hit a button and find out who did it. And um, there's even conversation about how we want to see this, we want to see these names because we want to have unpleasant, uncomfortable conversations with our neighbors. 
So it really is, I think, there's a sense that there's a threat, that the act of putting your name out there is different because the internet makes it different. Again, at oral argument, we have an amazing split between Justices Scalia and Alito, two people that you don't often see coming to really different conclusions. But on this issue, they come to fundamentally different conclusions. Justice Scalia gets up and says, civic courage, if you sign a ballot petition, have the courage of your conviction. You are performing a legislative act. My God, we didn't even have a secret ballot in this country. And if you are going to believe something and stand for something, put your name behind it. And if someone wants to come and make you feel bad, yell at each other. That's the American way. It's certainly the Scalia way. Um, and I think that this is Justice Scalia's position. And for him, it's indefensible to say that these names should be secret that you should be allowed to sign a petition that is, a, in effect, uh, a legislative act, but nobody knows who signed it. Justice Alito is so worried about the impact of these families, right? You've put your name on a ballot initiative. Someone's going to come to your house. They're going to uh, hunt down your children at school. And there's talk, again, in the opinion about how easy it is, right? With Google Maps, you can just look someone up, find out who opposes uh, you know, who, who is going to try to repeal the gay marriage law in Washington, and with two clicks, you can find out what their income is, where their kids go to school, and the name of their dog. And this is a different world, and this is the anxiety that Justice Alito bespeaks when he talks about this case at oral argument. And Clarence Thomas very, very much uh, takes his position. And when the case comes down, uh, in the end, Justice, uh, the, the court upholds the Sunshine Law and the, says, of course, of course, these names can be public. Uh, but Justice Thomas says, quote, in his dissent, technology today creates the possibility that all signers of all referendums will be subject to harassment. So in his view, anytime any of you put your name on a ballot now, that has to be a private act because if it goes on the internet, all bets are off. Someone can come get you. This is, again, a dramatically different vision of privacy and openness, and I think a very, very strong identification that we're seeing, at least from Justices uh, Alito and Thomas, with the victims of, of uh, hateful speech, with people who they see as subject to assaultive speech. And that's, that, I think, split becomes more manifest this term. So this past term that just finished begins even before the court hears arguments with Justice Stephen Breyer uh, going on George Stephanopoulos' show to promote his book. Um, and what he says is, he's talking about the Quran burning priest in Florida. And uh, George Stephanopoulos says to him, does this change, the fact that someone is going to burn a Quran in Florida and there may be uh, violence incited. There may be real reprisals and violence incited. And Breyer says, yes, it does change uh, my view of the First Amendment. And I think maybe it's time we re-examine incitement doctrine. And he says, you know, the famous Oliver Wendell Holmes formulation is, you know, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Well, says Justice Breyer on national television, the internet has turned the whole world into a crowded theater. There's no more private Quran burnings anymore. It's all out there. And someone in Pakistan may well respond to your act of burning a Quran with violent action. And that's enough to think very hard about what is protected by the First Amendment and what isn't. So this brings us to this fall. Now, this last year is considered a blockbuster year for First Amendment cases at the court. Now, partly it's a blockbuster year because it was really a lame term for most of our purposes. It wasn't a terribly exciting term. This term coming up is going to be huge. But last term, the big, big, big cases are the speech cases. And the one you'll probably remember, the one that garnered by far the most attention of any case this term, uh, was Snyder v. Phelps. And that was the funeral protest case. Now, I want you to think about what I've just said about how the court has this growing anxiety about the victims of hateful speech and the way new media changes their experience of that speech. When I tell you that even though Snyder v. Phelps, and you're familiar, I think, with the facts, right, that the, the Phelps family church goes around to military funerals, they go to Matthew Snyder's funeral, and they protest with the most 
horrifying language and signs. Uh, the American policy on uh, giving rights to homosexuals and the signs say things like God hates fags and thank God for dead soldiers and the whole funeral becomes a celebration of hate. And the family of Matthew Snyder, who by the way is not gay, who's killed in Iraq, uh, are horrified and they actually sue for intentional infliction of emotional damages and they win. And the court throws out uh, uh, the conviction, uh, I'm sorry, the, throws out the damage award saying no, this is protected speech. They're holding up signs, it was, they were within the zone that they were allowed to be in. Uh, and this is, this is speech of public concern, they're talking about war, they're talking about uh, gay rights in America, this is protected speech. So probably not surprisingly, although I think America hated the results, Eight to one, the court says, of course this is protected speech. This, we're not going to move the needle on free speech uh, just because the Phelps family is gross. Uh, you know, they're awful, but when have you ever met a person in a free speech case who is nice, right? There, it's always Klansmen and awful people saying terrible things, and that's what the First Amendment protects. This is an easy, easy case for the court. Uh, except for two people, interestingly. One, unsurprisingly, is Sam Alito who uses a lot of the same language we heard the year before in the Stevens case, in the violent uh, crush videos ca case, where he talks about this um, as an assault. And he says, he says um, quote, in his dissent, and it is an amazing dissent, by the way, uh, our profound national commitment to free and open debate is not a license for the vicious verbal assault that occurred in this case. In Alito's view, this is not a speech case. This is like punching the Snyder family in the face, and he will not protect it. The rest of the court uh, does not agree. I think the interesting person in this case, and the one who didn't get a ton of attention, was Justice Stephen Breyer, who was not all that bothered by the funeral protest. I think, for, in his view, that was a classic speech problem. You know, protesters come and they are rude, but there it is. But he was really bothered, and I think this is very important, by something that went up on the internet. Along with the funeral protest, the Phelps family wrote an epic ode, they called it, in which they personally assailed the Snyder family. So it wasn't like they were carrying the same signs that they carry to every funeral. This was very personal. This was about Matt Snyder. This was about his parents being bad parents. And it was up on the internet. And this part of the speech, uh, of the case, which I think is the most interesting part, right? They've now really, I think, assailed a family on the internet. It falls away. And so, so Justice Breyer's trying to ask questions about it at argument. Nobody listens to him. He says in his concurrence, you know, that part of it was the interesting part of the case to me, this, the internet speech, but we never got to it, so I can live with this result. It seems to me that Breyer is sort of looking down the tunnel and saying, this would be a very hard case, or a much harder case, if you look at the internet speech, if you look at the television part of this case, the new media stuff that had fallen out. So Breyer's worrying, just as he was worrying with George Stephanopoulos, about how television and the internet change everything. So that brings us finally to the last case I want to talk about, which is the violent video games case. Again, this is an easy case. It doesn't really move the First Amendment needle because it turns out that incredibly violent video games are still speech. Uh, so, you know, this case comes up to the court, and again, everybody's like, what's new here? I mean, they said this about comic books, that comic books made kids crazy. They said it about jazz. Uh, you know, every generation looks at whatever new uh, media is doing and said, this is the one that makes our kids bananas. And every generation is wrong, and it's always protected speech. It's an easy, easy case for the court. Uh, but again, two amazing dissents. So seven to two, the court says, of course, violent video games are protected speech. This isn't hard. In fact, Justice Scalia compares it to Dante, right? He's like, not only is Mortal Kombat protected speech, it's the modern day equivalent of epic poetry. And everybody goes, Ugh. but that's what the court does. It protects speech. The two dissenters are really interesting. Again, very strange bedfellows. One is Justice Clarence Thomas, who makes the point that this is a privacy issue, that in colonial times, parents had the right to protect the messages uh, that got to their children. And in fact, 
the descent reads like a sort of a, a longing ode to the time when your kids were really scared of you. Uh, I read that descent to my children when they don't behave. Um, and, and so for Breyer, this is a privacy issue that, 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 that um, the world cannot come in and give your children messages, particularly violent messages that you don't sanction. But I think the really interesting dissent comes from Justice Stephen Breyer, who really goes through all the data, all the studies, studies that, by the way, the defendants did not put into evidence in the case, and says, look, you didn't do the research, so I'm going to do it for you, or I'm going to make some clerks do it. Um, and pages and pages and pages of evidence that, in fact, violent video games are different, and they do make children violent. But again, that thread throughout Breyer's term, I think, saying the new media is different. We have to think about this in different ways. Um, and, I, and I do think that Breyer gets two big I told you so moments this year. Because we all laughed at him, or most of us laughed at him, when he said we're going to change the fire in a crowded theater standard just because some nutty pastor in Florida wants to burn Qurans. But not very long after that, uh, the pastor did burn, as you may recall, a Quran, and there were Americans killed in Pakistan in reprisal for that. So we can certainly say that doesn't mean we change the First Amendment standard, but I think it does say Breyer is not wrong to want to think about this in new ways. And I think his other I told you so moment is that after his long, long dissent about the connection between violent video games and violence, there was pretty compelling evidence that the shooter in Norway two months ago had devoted tens and tens and tens and tens of hours to playing violent video games and really kind of got lost in them in an alternate world in the ways that Breyer was afraid of in his Schwarzenegger descent. Now, I don't mean to suggest to you by any means that that means that uh, we should clamp down on First Amendment rights, but I do think it means that Justices Breyer and Alito and Thomas are acutely aware for different reasons and complicated reasons of how the media is changing the boundaries of what is private speech and what is public speech, that the media is very much changing the audience so that speech that you think you're making somewhere with regard to something is out there in the whole entire world and that does implicate uh, you know, the possibility of violent reprisals. I think that they, the three of them in different ways are more and more of the view that the media is systematically helping to turn what used to be speech into assault. Uh, and that speech that used to be experienced as just speech, fire in a crowded theater, is now, when you're the Phelps family, reading about your son, your fallen son, on the internet, into something that's a lot closer to being punched in the face. And I think that shot through all of this uh, is a real anxiety that the media is enabling, is, is helping, is constantly helping at the peril of the victims of the speech. And, um, I just want to suggest, and here's the sort of radical part of what I want to say, that the possibility, if I'm right, that three of the justices are acutely uh, identifying and perhaps over-identifying with the victims of speech, I want to say I think it's not completely an accident. And I want to suggest to you that most of the justices on the su current Supreme Court have had one and only one encounter with the media in their lives. And it hasn't been a fun one. It's been their confirmation hearings. And that in my view, if you look at who it is that is most intensely horrified by the possibility of television cameras and gotcha photographs on telephones, it is the two people who say, right or wrong, that they had the most harrowing confirmation hearings of their life that the lowest moment in their career was the five-day crucible that was their confirmation hearings. Now, you and I know, I think even the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee know, that this is meaningless ritual, that these hearings are just ritual bloodletting. Yes, they're awful, but nobody takes it seriously. But it turns out 
when you're on the receiving end of, of a hearing in which you're being called all sorts of unspeakable things, and in Justice Sam Alito's case, your wife is driven from the room in tears because of what's being said. It's entirely possible that you come away thinking that maybe televisions and cameras are not a good thing. Uh, most of the justices on the current Supreme Court have never had an experience with the media. If you've served on the bench for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, at the most you've had a newspaper write something snotty about a ruling you made in a trial. That's the worst thing that could happen to you. But federal judges, particularly in academics, are not people who understand or are used to the proposition that this is all theater. And so I think that we want to be very, very careful as the confirmation process gets uglier and more divisive, and I think, in fact, more personal and visceral about what we are telling the justices about what an encounter with the public and the media means. And so my one thought, um, and I say this simply as a kind of cautionary tale is that we like to believe that those hearings happen and they pop up and they go away and they're good sport for all of us. But if they are in fact affecting the way the courts think about things like television, uh, then I think we want to really think hard about whether this is a process that's worth it. Because it can't be the case that justices who go through hearings that are that awful are then going to turn around and say, welcome into the ceremonial courtroom, television cameras. We really want to do more of this. Uh, that's never going to happen. So I think that the rancorous hearings are happening at our peril, at least in terms of First Amendment doctrine. I think the same is true, and this is a harder question for me as a reporter, with these gotcha moments that we're having in the press. And so think, for instance, of Justice Alito, who goes to the president's State of the Union speech and hears something he doesn't like about the Citizens United decision and says, as you may famously recall, even if you don't read lips, that's not true, and is captured doing that on camera. And that's the news story for two days. That's the news story, is that Justice Alito um, you know, spoke back to the president, and you also may recall Justice Alito didn't come to the next State of the Union. So this gotcha moment where we're like, here you go, here's Justice Alito, here's a snapshot of a fight between the president uh, of the United States and the Supreme Court Justice, I promise you, I promise you, I can't promise you because only Justice Alito can tell you, but my very strong guess is he didn't do that with the intention of being on all the national news shows that night. That was just a, a, a quick and angry reaction, but the idea that he became the story must have been horrifying for him. And I think it completely explains why uh, he's probably not going to go to another such hearing again. The same is true, I think, of uh, a speech that, uh, that Justice Alito gave last year where, again, reporters with camera phones doing their jobs but get right up in his face and start taking pictures, and there it is. Here's Justice Alito speaking at a, a fundraiser. So I think that as the relationship that we have with the, with the court turns into a series of unpleasant gotcha moments, we are more and more inclined, I think, to, t to tell the justices that the press is something to be feared and the public is something to be feared. Now, I... I want to be very clear that I think there's an easy solution to this problem, and the solution is to roll in the television cameras for oral argument. In other words, I think that right now we're in a very paradoxical situation where reporters are jumping out of subway cars and taking photographs of justices because they can't come into the courtroom and watch the justices do their jobs. And so to me, the best thing that the justices can do is have us watch them not do their job interview, the confirmation hearing, but their actual job, uh, which is, which is uh, oral argument. And I think the more they allow us to have access to the court at its very best, it's entirely possible there would be much less press attention focused on the justices at their very worst. But I think now we really have the worst of both worlds. We have a court that is ever more fearful of the public, uh, and we have a public that is really ever less careful about how we access and talk to and talk about the court. So I want to I want to close my my remarks by saying why I think this matters. Why I think it matters that we have 
By my lights, three and maybe four justices on the court who are conflating some of their bad experiences with the press and the public and the media with First Amendment doctrine and who are so strongly convinced that the media is different, the world we live in is different, the public is terrifying, uh, that to give any access to the court is to lose all dignity and that that is starting to affect doctrine, right? It's affecting doctrine, I think, in the Doe v. Reed case, affecting doctrine in Snyder. Most importantly, I think it affects doctrine in matters that we haven't heard yet, which is the Citizens United case, where Clarence Thomas, dissenting, says not only should we knock down uh, the provisions of McCain-Feingold that are at issue today, but we should do away with the disclosure rules. Why? Because if a, somebody, a donor to a campaign, has to disclose her name on the internet, people will come to her house and harass her and be subject to reprisals. So this isn't just one case. It's not just two. I think it's a thread of First Amendment anxiety that is really starting to weave itself through two years of doctrine. Now, I hope I am wrong. Uh, I hope that I'm just noticing a trend that is going to prove to be completely wrong. But I think I'm not, and here's my best evidence. This growing fear of the public and of the media and of speech, in my view, came to its height a year ago when, the, for the first time in the history of the court, the building locked its front doors to the public. And for the first time, you could not access the United States Supreme Court building under that amazing language that says, equal justice under the law. And now you have to go round and down. And this seems trivial. It's an entrance. But it's not an entrance. I think it's the court betraying a real fear of the world out there and the court in here, and that every attempt to try to open the court in my view in the last couple of years, has resulted in a retraction of the court, a, a court retreating more and more uh, from the media and, and from uh, the public. So I think to me, even though it's a purely symbolic act, the closing of the doors, to me I think it goes to this deep, deep sense that we are in an us and them adversarial relationship uh, and that everything has changed in a way that is threatening. Uh, to the justices. And this is at a moment, I would submit, where the justices know us, us less than they've ever known us. They all come from two law schools. Their clerks all come from about seven law schools. This is a court that has contracted to the point uh, that they really need to hear from us right now. And they can't hear from us if they are terrified of us. And they can't hear from us if our notion of communicating with the court is jumping up in their face with a camera phone. So I think going forward, I'm going to make a strong plea for thinking more carefully on the court's part principally about issues of how to allow the press to access the court in healthy ways, and on our part as citizens about respectful and yet I think rigorous ways to engage with the court, ways that aren't trivial and that don't diminish uh, the dignity of the court. I think that that's an urgent question that we have to ask ourselves, because I think the alternative is increasingly rancorous and partisan hearings that result in increasingly fearful First Amendment doctrine. Justices who really come to feel that the public and the media are against them and that speech is experienced more and more as an assault and not as speech. And I think that unless we sit down and figure out a way to think through these issues in constructive ways, we're really at a race to the bottom where the ways we think about the court are going to be increasingly, I think, uh, violative and assaultive and the way the court experiences us is going to be increasingly violative and assaultive. So I would just urge you to think about, going forward, these questions. Does technology change speech? Does the media change everything? Is Justice Breyer correct in saying uh, that we need to reassess everything based on the world we live in today? These are hard questions, and I don't have easy answers for them, but I think they're questions 
that Justice Breyer is quite right to say need to be answered now and not in 20 years. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. I'm also, I should add that I'm also happy to take questions about the term or next term. Go ahead. I think we have a mic. Hold on one second. It's the one way that technology is bad, right? Can you say, I'm sorry, I'm just not hearing you. Can you ask it one more time? It's a good question. I mean, certainly when you ask the justices why they don't want to have cameras in the Supreme Court, um, and I should just add as, a, as an interesting aside, the British Supreme Court is now going to televise in an, in an epic uh, change. Uh, the Canadian Supreme Court has had cameras in there for 20 years uh, without incident. Uh, so it's not uh, quite as, as uh, persuasive to me as it should be. But certainly the answer to the question when you ask the justices why is the court different, you know, why, why can we televise Congress and not the court, and there's this array of answers, and one of them is your point, which is Stephen Colbert, you know, it's The Daily Show, is that if we televise the court, we will become embarrassing sound bites, and that will be the totality of what we are. Um, you know, to which my response is, I think that uh, there's always that hazard. But I think that the payoff from televising the court, and we've seen this, the court has released audio uh, for important arguments over the year. And it's amazing. You don't know how many nerdy friends you have until you see them bent over NPR listening to same day oral arguments in Bush v. Gore, in, in the affirmative action cases in Heller. I mean, people loved it. And I think that that audio gives people a real window into what the court does into what the court is actually like. And so it seems to me there is a cost, which is um, you have these moments where you look ridiculous. Now, there's a way to fix that, which is don't be ridiculous. Um, but I think that the benefit is so high. The benefit is you would see nine people who work harder than anyone you've ever met. You would see a court that is not a cartoonish assemblage of five conservatives and four liberals screaming at each other. You, I, I mean, I, to my view, the big sin is covering confirmation hearings, which are partisan and rancorous and ideological, and not covering oral argument, which is the opposite. And so what we're doing is we are showing America the worst possible version of the court when we could show them the best possible version. Now, I just want to make one other point that I think goes to something I was saying earlier. I think it's really interesting that various justices have testified over the years uh, about whether there should be cameras in the courts. And it's always interesting to hear their answers. Your, your question is Justice Kennedy's answer. Justice Kennedy says, I, I don't want to be that guy. You know, I don't want to be made fun of. Justice Thomas is worried about security. Justice Thomas, when he testified about this, said, you know, we, we can't uh, take the risk of being recognized. So I think, again, uh, there's a sense that we would be vulnerable uh, to the public in a way that we're not now. And, and the very last thing I want to say about this um, is, that, is that the court has had this audio policy for many years that was really interesting, where by some unknowable metric, uh, they would decide to release same-day audio on a handful of big cases a year. So if you think back, you know, you probably listened to uh, the guns case, you listened to a partial birth abortion, you listened to Bush v. Gore that morning, but up until then the court only released them at the end of the year. 
Well, a lot of people said that's a crazy policy. Why would you only release same-day audio in cases that are guaranteed to be partisan and 5-4? All you're doing is confirming to America that the court is uh, the thing that they read about, you know, this purely partisan ideological body. If you're really, really determined to release audio and give America a sense of what the court does all day, do the really boring land use cases, you know, that do those incredibly, incredibly dormant commerce clause like snoozers, and then find out how interesting and important the work of the court, all due respect to the dormant co commerce clause, but you know, the, the, um, the work of the court is. And so it just seems to me that they did exactly the wrong thing, and that the right thing is to say, come in and come into our house and see what we do. And Elena Kagan actually gave a talk this year I know this is now turning into a five-part answer, I'm sorry, but Elena Kagan gave a talk this year where she said she's actually rethinking her policy about cameras in the court for this very reason. And she said that as Solicitor General, she really was blown away by how well-prepared and thoughtful and impressive oral argument was and how it modeled something that you don't see modeled anywhere else in Washington, which is smart people working really hard to solve problems in a civil way. And what a good idea to let America see that. Now, that's one vote out of nine, but I do think that that's the counter-argument, that what the court does, and I, I know I have a, a wicked case of Patty Hearst syndrome where I'm in love with my captor and so I, I think the court really is astounding and that if we were all allowed to watch it the way I'm allowed to watch it, uh, we, would, we would come away with far more respect uh, than Stephen Colbert could do damage. Mm -hmm. Not, not that I know of. It's a good question. I don't know of, of a case that's, that's coming up. I know that the way I see it coming up isn't through the cases. Uh, it's through the court, and not just the Supreme Court, but courts around the country struggling with um, the, their accreditation issues because courts around the country have to decide this, not as a matter of doctrine. As a matter of procedure, they have to decide, are we going to let bloggers in? Are we going to let uh, interested citizens with a laptop in? You know, where do we draw that line? And it's been a source of enormous anxiety uh, for, for uh, public information offices around the country. I will say that the Supreme Court hasn't accredited a blogger. Um, it's only accredited, I mean, I think I'm one of two online journalists that are accredited at the U.S. Supreme Court. So, you know, I think that that gives you some sense of where that marker is. It continues to be pretty much limited uh, to print television and radio. But it was interesting. I think the Scooter Libby trial is a really good counterexample where uh, the, the court decided to credential huge numbers of bloggers and, in fact, uh, the bloggers, I think it's generally believed, acquitted themselves better uh, than the print press in that particular case. I mean, did a better job of being on top of the legal issues and blogging quickly and doing a really good job in that trial. But it does present a whole host of problems. And there is, I think, a widespread sense uh, in courts around the country that they don't want to credential just anybody who walks in the door and says they're press. Uh, and I think they're struggling with it. I think that's the way we're seeing that anxiety work itself out is, is who do we allow into our courtroom, particularly in a court like the Supreme Court where there's only a handful uh, of seats in the first place. Anyone else? Well then I'm delighted. Thank you very much for coming and happy Constitution Day and um, uh, thank you for spending a late Friday afternoon with me. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.